the Fed decision coming right up. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Equity futures up 9 tenths of 1%. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York City, we begin with the big issue. Chairman Powell taking center stage. Chair Powell. Chairman Powell. Federal Reserve Chairman Powell. We have uh, the Fed meeting. It's either 75 or 100. 75 basis point hike is more than price. They need to give the market a bit of cold turkey. Surprise upside hike of 100 basis points. Say, look, we are credible. Regain that credibility in inflation fighting. Key focus, I think, is going to be on the signaling uh, for the upcoming meetings. We're not expecting big forward guidance from the Fed. Less forward guidance or more uncertainty. Chair Powell will essentially uh, signal data dependency here, uh, keep options open. The Fed clearly has to fight inflation. Whatever it takes to bring inflation down. Jerome Powell has made that very clear. Joining us now, two of my absolute favorites, JP Morgan's Bob Michael, Christian Mamani of Lafayette College. Bob, let's get straight into it. What are you looking for later? Hi, John. We're looking for the Fed to raise rates 75 basis points. They had the opportunity several weeks ago to go the 100 basis point option, but they quickly swatted that one away. So look for 75. And we also expect that they'll confirm that in September they're going to full balance sheet runoff of 60 billion a month in treasuries and 35 billion a month in mortgages. So pretty much down the road with the focus on maintaining some, maintaining some vigilance on inflation. Krishna, are you on the same page? There's not much of a surprise with respect to what the Fed is going to do with respect to the balance sheet and the, 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 at least the current Fed funds uh, uh, raise. I think what is going to be far more interesting is what the Fed, what Powell says about what the future path of rates looks like. And there, the critical element is the markets are pricing in a cut in, in 2023, early 2023. He just is not in a position to validate that right now. And we are pricing that really hard, both in the equity markets and the credit markets and the bond markets. So that's where the, the tussle is going to be. Krishna, Bill Ackman speaks to that. He said this, the more the market believes that the Fed will immediately reverse course, the less effective raising rates will be in moderating inflation and the more the Fed will have to raise interest rates. Is that the kind of thing you're trying to say, Krishna? Yeah, I, I think easing of financial conditions is not conducive to what the Fed's goals, goals are at the moment. Having said that, they cannot ignore the data altogether. The data has been softening, at least macro data has been softening. So that has to be incorporated in their thinking. So I think it is too early to talk about cutting rates. And but Powell is too, uh, uh, too kind of uh, experienced to kind of fall for that sort of a trap. But data dependency is what they are going to talk about and dodge the question effect. Uh, Bob, this is about how you navigate the news conference and how you recognize the weakness we've already seen in the U.S. economy. How do you think Chairman Powell is going to navigate this one? Well, I think he's going to make sure that the market understands they are 110 percent focused on inflation. They've sent that message for the last six, seven months even if it means causing a recession. So they're going to tell us they're going to look at a range of core inflation metrics, and unless those come down to something that looks acceptable to them, they're going to keep hiking rates. I also think they're going to take what the market's giving them, a Fed funds rate about 3.5% over year end, and support that and not get into a conversation about when they will or will not cut rates. Bob, do you think we can avoid a recession this year? I think they can avoid it this year. And I think what you're seeing uh, in the earnings reports, you look at some of the big tech companies, they're uh, coming in uh, with rather pleasant forecasts. And you look at anything in travel and leisure, uh, and they're blowing out uh, the expectations. And it's still a, a pretty tight labor market. I think the problem uh, is next year. And I think they've already told us that the inflation fight is the priority and probably saving the economy from recession ain't going to happen. You mentioned some of those tech firms. We've got Alphabet, Google up by about 4 percent. A sigh of relief is the way a lot of people put it yesterday after that earnings report came out. Mike McKee's going to join us now from D.C. Looking ahead to your questions, Mike, in that news conference later. 
Yeah, uh, big questions are going to be the ones that have been posed uh, by uh, Bob and Krishna there. Uh, what happens next? Uh, the Fed is looking at an economy that is defined by two lines on a graph. One is inflation, which is going up but has started to maybe roll over, and then growth, which has fallen. And the question is, do we see another negative print tomorrow when second quarter GDP comes out? That becomes less likely with the strong data we heard today. So maybe the Fed says, well, what we're seeing here is what we expected to see. The economy slow down because we raised rates, but it doesn't mean we're going into recession, which is why you get the 75 basis points and then you only get the vague forward guidance from Jay Powell, not telling you whether it's going to be 50 or 75, probably sticking with the fact that they'll just uh, tell you that they are anticipating further rate increases. So then the question is, how do they assess inflation and growth? What can the market read into what Powell is saying? Because at this point, uh, they don't know any more than anybody does about where this economy is going. Uh, what they are looking at, though, is where they are. And here's another question for Powell. What's your terminal rate? If they raise 75 today, they will be, on the ter in terms of the effective Fed funds rate, where it trades just below the area they consider neutral. So expect them to do at least 50 more by the end of the year to get into neutral. The question will be, and if I get the right rotation in the question asking, it's what I would ask, is uh, do you have to go above neutral? Do you have to be tight? to get the inflation rate down. Mike McKee, you know how this works. Bob Michael's always got some advice on what you should ask in that news conference. Bob Michael, what's that advice right now? Dying to get in there, Mike. I want to be next to you. I think you got to ask him, at one, what run rate of core inflation measures does he have to see to pause? And at what run rate of core inflation measures does he have to see to cut rates? Our estimate is he needs to see core inflation toggle between three and four tenths of a month, three and four tenths of a percent per month to pause and two tenths of a percent for several months, think three to six months before they even start cutting rates. We don't think he sees that anytime soon because the labor market is still too tight and shelter um, is still going up at a very high rate. Mike McKee, are you still there? Because if you are, what's your sense yeah. of things on that front? Uh, I think Bob's probably got a good range of numbers, but I think the way Powell would answer it is the old Potter Stewart definition of pornography is uh, we don't know how to define it, but we will know it when we see it. They want to see a sustained drop in inflation. Now, the interesting thing here, guys, is, too, we're seven weeks away, almost two months away from the next Fed meeting after this one. We'll have two CPI reports, but the second CPI report falls in the blackout period just before the Fed meeting in September. So if we get a high print or a low print, you may or may not have guidance from the Fed on what they think about it. You'll get a Wall Street Journal article, Mike. You know how that works. <laughs> Mike McKee, thank you, buddy. Krishna Mamani, you get two CPI prints before the September meeting. You also get two job reports. And Krishna, I wonder, is it too early to expect some of the weakness we're seeing in certain parts of this economy to show up in those labor market reports before that September meeting? Well, so we are seeing some uh, uh, very small weakness uh, uh, or very uh, not much weakness in the labor markets. Uh, having said that, I think that they are really very data dependent at the moment. They don't know. They didn't anticipate the slowdown that we are seeing right now. On the other hand, there's a case to be made that what we are going through is an inventory liquidation. And in a quarter, maybe things go away and, and we are back to where we were before. Maybe not at the same pace, but uh, from a growth perspective at a comparable level. So those are the things that the Fed is going to deal with. I think for now, they're going to stick with what is being priced in the market, which is probably 50 basis points and a couple uh, 25 basis points. There's really no reason for them to change that, uh, uh, change that state of the market. Hold up, Krishna, you've just said something that I don't think many people have said at all. Do you think there's a risk that this slowdown might be a head fake? Well, I, I think there is a substantial risk. Uh, you know, if you look at the 
uh, consumer data. You are not seeing meaningful uh, slowdown in consumption. You are not seeing the level of slowdown that you would expect in the labor markets based on the, the uh, macro data that you're seeing. So there is a substantial risk that things are not slowing as fast as the macro data is telling you, and therefore pricing in a rate cut in early 2023 may be premature. In my view, if there is going to be a new reset in the equity market on the, uh, on the, on the downside, It'll come with that uh, that sort of a, a scenario playing out in the market. Bob, what's your reaction to that? Well, I'm glad to see that Krishna gets out of the ivory tower a bit and is out in the real world <laughs> because he's right. At the September meeting, they're going to be looking at all the summer data. We know people are out traveling, they're spending, they shifted their spending plans. I think the problem with, with uh, Krishna's uh, narrative is that the stronger the consumer is, and by the way, uh, businesses and households are going into this slowdown with the strongest balance sheets that anyone could remember. All that means is that the Fed has higher to ra raise rates and try to lean into this a bit heavier than the market's expecting. Krishna, I think that was a dig. You can respond if you want. Well, uh, you know, Ivory Tower is a good place to be. Uh, you know, you, it's, <laughs> it's pretty relaxing, and Bob would like to be here. But the, the, the point I'm trying to make, however, is that, look, do I know it's a head fake? I don't, and nor does the Fed. And that's a possibility, and they have to incorporate that possibility in their thinking. And therefore, if they're worried about inflation from uh, getting unanchored, uh, they cannot really, uh, really talk about easing or even give any signal to that effect unless they're very, very sure that things have slowed down. And that's not the case right now. Krishna, Bob, you're going to be sticking with me. Futures this morning up nine tenths of one percent on the S&P, at one point six on the Nasdaq. Big tech helping out in a big way this morning. Let's get to Kelly Dines for more. Hey, Kelly. Hey, John. Yeah, it's all about tech this morning and better than expected results from Microsoft and Alphabet after the bell yesterday. Let's start with Microsoft because they actually did perform, report their biggest uh, miss in quarterly estimates since 2016 in part due to FX headwinds, but the outlook was strong. Dan Ives at Wedbush actually calling it shockingly strong. The company says it'll be aided by an easing in costs as they slow hiring. Plus, they think customers will actually pivot toward the cloud as they look to control uh, their technology spending in a slowing environment. So as a result, Microsoft is up 3.6%. Alphabet up that about that much as well. Remember, we were all super concerned about advertising revenue after the results from Snap. Well, apparently, at least in the search business, advertising is still doing well. So their revenue came in in line. That stock up the better part of 4% as a result. Texas Instruments also giving a rosy outlook. The easing of lockdowns in China has a little something to do with that, so the chipmaker is higher. And finally, PayPal isn't an earnings story, but it is a big mover on the day, up more than 7%. Elliott Investment Management, the activist investor, reportedly taking a stake in that company, pushing to accelerate those cost-cutting efforts. So optimism around that is lifting the shares today, John. Kelly, thank you. More from Kelly around the opening bell. Coming up, President Biden preparing to speak with China's Xi. He intends to uh, have a conversation with President Xi uh, of China here shortly. I'm going to leave. I'm going to. I'm going to uh, leave our commentary on that issue uh, for the president. As I mentioned, he's going to be having a phone call. Fresh tensions between those two countries. That conversation coming up. There's still political pressure leaning on this inflation, inflation, inflation. And I think they've gone too far on that. So I could get very, very bullish if the Fed makes it sound like they are really going to balance this recession risk. If they come in all in on inflation, ignoring recession risk, then I think it's another big leg down for stocks. Political pressure building on Chairman Powell as the White House continues to grapple with inflation. The U.S. still undecided on China tariffs. As House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's potential trip to Taiwan stills the spotlight. We don't get in a habit of uh, taking part in a back and forth uh, with our uh, Chinese uh, counterparts, in this case with uh, my uh, MFA uh, counterpart. What we have said on this uh, still stands. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, the Speaker's office has not uh, announced any travel, uh, and our approach to uh, Taiwan has not changed in any way. AMH joins us down in D.C. Morning, Amory. Good morning, John. As you heard there, fresh tensions really between Washington and Beijing as President Biden is now going to be having a phone conversation. Bloomberg first to report that, that it's happening tomorrow. He's been foreshadowing for a number of days. It's the first time the two leaders spoke 
since March. There's going to be similar issues that likely potentially could come up. That's going to be the tariffs that we've been talking about for months as the administration weighs weighing whether or not they're going to lift some of those Trump era tariffs. But really, the fresh hot button issue is surrounding this trip, potential trip, we should note, because as Ned Price there had said, we do not have any uh, sort of announcement from Nancy Pelosi, the speaker's office, about whether or not she is going to go to Taiwan. But we know she is making this trip to Asia in August. Overnight, we heard from Kyoto News that she's preparing to go to Japan. Whether or not she goes to Taiwan, this has now become a really tense issue, even in Washington, D.C. You have uh, colleagues of hers from the Republican Party pushing her to go. At the same time, the president was very direct recently with reporters saying the military doesn't think it's such a good idea right now. The two things to watch tomorrow then, this call between the two leaders that we've reported on this morning, and then the GDP print tomorrow morning. AMH, just briefly, yeah. how did this begin? You and I talked about this. They are tying themselves in knots, trying to explain to people what is and what isn't a recession. So... Clearly, they wanted to get ahead of this GD print on Thursday. Uh, there's a number of calls out there saying that we, it could contract. Then that would mean we would have two back-to-back -back, uh, consecutive prints that would show contraction, which many on Wall Street would deem a, quote, technical recession. What they're trying to say is that's not the real definition of a recession. So before the media, before Republicans can take the fact of that potential print being bad, they were trying to get ahead of it. But as you say, Jonathan, they're tying themselves in knots now because now this is all anyone is talking about and asking about. But tomorrow, we will hear from Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. This is quite rare. She's holding a news conference tomorrow after this data. So there's going to be lots of questions about what they deem as a potential recession. They're likely going to say, we heard from Secretary Yellen, that it would be very difficult to say we're in a recession now when you have an unemployment rate yeah. of 3.6%. It's like getting two central bank news conferences in one week. AMH, thank you. <laughs> I'm Reid down in D.C. Back with us, Bob Michael, Krishna Mamani. Bob, for all the talk of recession, and there's much more of it over the last month, stocks are higher, not lower. Spreads are tighter, not wider. What's that telling you, Bob? It's telling us that, that the market is anticipating a recession, but a relatively shallow one. I think most everyone is pretty dismissive. If we have a negative second quarter real GDP, that doesn't mean recession. You've got to watch the unemployment rate. And the unemployment rate has to start going up meaningfully and probably has to get to around 5% before the National Bureau of Economic Research steps in and categorizes this as a recession. And we look a long way away from that. Bob, I hear the short and shallow thing so much. It has become the consensus view. You seem to share it. Can you tell me the biggest risk that you appreciate, the biggest risk around that consensus view, short and shallow recession? Well, the, the short and shallow recession seems pretty much Goldilocks uh, right now. I think most people have given up on the soft landing. I think the problem is uh, that perhaps the labor market's a lot uh, tighter than we think. Perhaps uh, business investment and consumer spending will continue at a very high rate. Uh, perhaps things in inflation uh, like wages and shelter are very sticky. And the Fed can't stop in the 3 to 3.5% three range. They have to go up towards 4%. And the market doesn't seem ready for that. Kristen, what do you make of the direction of travel? Stocks higher, spreads tighter. Well, so I, I think Bob, Bob is right. Uh, that is... Uh, uh, a uh, shallow recession is what the go what the consensus is, and it is truly Goldilocks, and that's what we are discounting in the marketplace. But I think there is a there is a case to be made again that uh, you know growth actually or uh, the the macro variables prove to be more resilient than what we are discounting, and therefore we may not have a recession. And it actually the Fed's dream of a, a a soft landing works out, but it just takes a long time for that to pan out. And the markets cannot take that. And that, that probably, for the U.S. economy, that probably wouldn't be that bad an outcome. For the stock market, however, that may be a, a, a bad outcome in the short run. That's a tussle. We, that's the thing we are dealing with at the moment. Since you're both good friends at Bloomberg Real Yield, let's finish with a rapid-fire round. And, Bob, I'll ask you the question that I've asked a lot of guests over the last few weeks. Do you think we've seen the highs on the U.S. 10-year for the year, yes or no? Yes. Krishna, do you? Yes. Have we seen the wides of the year on high yield spreads, Bob? Yes or no? Yes. Krishna? I'm in the ivory tower, so no. You're in the ivory tower, so no. So the both of you, both awesome, fantastic setup going into the Federal Reserve a little bit later. Bob Michael, Krishna Mamani there on the latest of this Fed and this market too.
So you've got a bit of disagreement around high yield spreads, but ultimately the consensus around the highest of the year on a 10 year, I hear that from pretty much everyone. I heard that from Marilyn Watson of BlackRock last week, Mike Collins of Peachim, George Borey of Allspring. You just heard it there from Chris Mamani of Lafayette and Bob Michael of JP Morgan. Trying to find a couple of people that are leaning the other way. So I'll desire Franklin Templeton is the one I remember. Your 10 year this morning down four basis points to 277. Your two year is unchanged at about 3.05%. So that curve, just a little more inversion for you, just a little bit more. Two's tens, negative 28. Coming up the morning calls and later, JP Morgan anticipating a Fed pivot as early as next year. Morgan Stanley's Lisa Shallot says the inflation fight is far from over. We'll catch up with Lisa in just a moment. From New York City, with futures positive off the back of earnings from Alphabet and Microsoft. We're up nine tenths of 1%. Looking ahead to Facebook numbers after the close, then on to Apple and Amazon tomorrow. Five or six minutes away from the opening bell this morning. Good morning. Here's the price action. A lift here up 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, up by 1.6%. We talked about 20% of the S&P 500 reporting across five names. You had two of them yesterday, Alphabet and Microsoft. And so far, so good. A sigh of relief. Resilience, the buzzword. I keep hearing a lot. You get more earnings a little bit later than again tomorrow. You'll hear from Apple. That's the price action on the equity side. Remember, the lows of the year, the day after the Fed last met. Something to think about, at least. On the bond side of things, yields come in four basis points on a 10-year, 277. So the curve, again, a little bit more flatter, a little bit more inversion. Your two-year unchanged at 3.05% going into this Fed decision. Just want to take a look at the euro. I know you will feel like the base case is a recession in Europe, but the economists aren't there yet. They're getting there slowly. We heard from Goldman. They're there year end. Now JP Morgan earlier this morning joining the party. Not much of a party you want to be a part of. Calling for a recession year end of the Eurozone. Euro dollar just a bit firmer this morning. Up a quarter of 1%. Euro dollar 101.43. That's the price action here in your morning calls. Deutsche Bank, Dan Grenning, McDonald's to hold. 259 price target, expecting limited upside with inflation weighing on results for the rest of the year. Morgan Stanley raising its alphabet price target to 145, highlighting the resiliency and strength of Google's search results following earnings. And finally, Citigroup cutting its Microsoft price target down to 300, calling quarterly results reassuring but not a clearing event with headwinds remaining. That stock is up by a little more than 3%. Coming up, big tech earnings boosting sentiment with a Fed rate decision on deck. Morgan Stanley's Lisa Shallot warning the latest bear market rally is full of wishful thinking. That conversation up next. About 24 seconds away from the opening bow this morning. Good morning to you. We have a lift on the S&P 500 by nine tenths of 1% on the Nasdaq 100 by 1.6%. Tick for Alphabet, tick for Microsoft. Looking ahead to Facebook a little bit later, then on to Apple and Amazon tomorrow. That's the price action. Switch up the board and get to the bond market. Going into the Fed, yields look like this. We're down three or four basis points on a 10-year. More curve inversion. Your 10-year right now, 277.21. Euro dollar, 101.42. Positive there by about a quarter of 1% and crude higher by a dollar and about 50 cents, up 1.6% to $96.50. We're about 15 seconds into this. We can get you some movers. We can welcome back Katie Greifeld. Hey, Katie. Hey, John. Well, we're finally in the heart of earnings season, finally getting some good news. You did have Microsoft post its first earnings miss since 2016. But a pretty rosy outlook, giving the stock a lift this morning. Shares higher by about 3.5%. Alphabet, a similar story there. It missed estimates, but ad sales were a bright spot. And remember, we were a little bit nervous after spot after Snap rather last week. So you're seeing a relief rally there. And broadening out from tech, you have Boeing catching a bit as well. It reported that it reversed its heavy cash burn. It actually generated $81 million in operating cash flow last quarter. Analysts were expecting another big loss there. That's why you see the stock up 
nearly 4% right now. And finally, we do have T-Mobile also popping after a beat and a raise subscriptions. Topped estimates and T-Mobile also raised its subscriber growth forecast for a second straight quarter, John. Katie, thank you. We've got a move of about 5% on the likes of Google, Alphabet up by 4.5%. Both companies, Alphabet and Microsoft, reporting double-digit revenue growth. The challenging macro conditions, Microsoft highlighted many of them, unfavorable foreign exchange, extended production shutdowns in China, take your pick. Reduction in ad spend, the ongoing war in Ukraine, tons of it. Does this set the tone for what we could hear from Apple, Amazon and Meta still to come. Let's get to Kelly Nice for more. Hey, Kelly. Hey, John. Well, it's certainly setting the tone for the broader market today because, of course, these are two giants. They're the second and fifth largest weightings in both the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. So no surprise, given that the stocks are moving higher off the back of these better than feared results, you're seeing a nice lift for the broader market as well with the NASDAQ 100 up about 1.6 percent. Now, of course, Microsoft, as Katie alluded to, the optim really is com optimism is coming from stronger than expected guidance. It expects revenue and operating income to grow by double digits again in fiscal 2023. My producer, Pete, was asking me earlier, how could a company that large continue to grow in double digits? It's really quite remarkable. Now, for Alphabet, you did have revenue coming in line, advertising spending hanging in there, which could be a signal that, A, Google as a larger company is just better positioned than smaller rivals like Snap and Twitter to withstand a pullback in marketing spending, and B, it's noteworthy that the strength came from search ads, not from YouTube, which is more socially oriented. On YouTube, ad revenue was actually only up about 4.8% relative to the near uh, 12 percent year on year growth that Google search saw. And it's the weakness in social ads in particular that is worth paying attention to as we look ahead to Meta's results after the bell today, because they're dealing not just with a slowdown in advertising broadly, but also competition from the likes of TikTok and those privacy rule changes on Apple that have dogged them for some time. Now, it's uh, it, we're gearing up for maybe a big move from Meta, about 12 and a half percentage points, plus or minus, uh, after the bell, even though that's a little bit less than the average move is what is implied by options at this point. And of course, we'll also get Qualcomm after the bell, then Apple and Amazon coming on Thursday. And Amazon, remember, is a growing player in the ad space. So it'll be interesting to see what the read through is to that company as we also look for clues around the consumer, especially in light of the news from Walmart yesterday, John. Kelly, thank you. Busy 24 hours coming up. The first three minutes of this session look like this. We are positive by eight tenths of one percent on the S&P. Communication services up by 1.9 percent. The strength where you'd expect the strength to be. Information technology up by 1.66 percent. For Wall Street, the rate hike bets are in. The consensus is 75 basis points. There was just one. I saw one looking for 100 basis points. It's been Nomura front and center for a long, long time now. Mike McKee joins us for more. Hey, Mike. Good morning, John. Well, you get this interesting confluence of earnings and a Fed decision that's pretty much priced in. And you may not get a whole lot of moves today, but we do have economic data over the next two days that could move the market's anticipation of what the Fed's going to do in September. Now, a lot of people have been looking at the 210 yield curve. Jay Powell says he prefers the three-month, 18-month forward curve, and it has gotten a little bit more negative, a little bit uh, flatter after the data today. And it's been the short end that moved it, the blue line there, uh, that's because the data were good and it may mean the Fed does more in the long run. But we'll ask him about that. Does this point to recession, the fact that we've gone uh, so deeply negative on, uh, well, we're almost negative, not quite there yet, on the 318. Now, here's what the markets will be looking for after this week. You get July payrolls and you get two CPI reports and a PCE. That last CPI report comes after the Fed's in blackout. So we won't know what they think of it. But these will give us the clues as to what the Fed thinks needs to be done. Is growth too strong? Is growth too weak? Is inflation still too strong or still coming down? And the way to track all that, and you can do that starting today and this afternoon, is by following trading in Fed funds futures, of course. And you can see here sort of an active billboard of uh, what's happening. At this point, uh, the market sees a 60 percent chance of a uh, rate increase a little bit uh, between 50 and uh, 75 basis points for September. But they really back off. And by the end of the year, they're not looking for much of a move at all. Uh, that would be a quarter point move. So let's see how that changes as we get the data the next two days and then the jobs and inflation data going forward. Mike McKee is not in an ivory tower. And we're looking forward to his questions in that news conference coming up a little bit later. Mike McKee there down in Washington, D.C. Morgan Stanley's Lisa Shannon has got things to say. Here's the quote. A modest uptick in unemployment
unemployment claims from historically low levels is unlikely to end the Fed's mission if inflation remains well above their 2% target. The latest bear market rally, in our view, is full of wishful thinking. Profit forecasts still need to be reset. Lisa, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. Lisa, let's start with that line. The latest rally is full of wishful thinking. What are we wishing for? Kicked off the segment, you know, focused on uh, technology earnings is probably, uh, you know, one of the hearts of the problem. Uh, you know, for investors who, you know, think that this second quarter, um, you know, is the signal of an all clear, um, I just don't think that they're looking at the data. Uh, if we look at the rollover in PMIs and we look at the rollover in the, the Fed regional surveys, we know that the overall uh, economy is beginning to slow and slow pretty provocatively. Um, when that happens, we know that year over year profit growth really slows, uh, if not outright contracts. And so, um, you know, this is a market that seems to have forgotten, at least on the equity side, uh, that Fed policy operates with leads and lags. Uh, and right now, um, we're sitting in front of a very aggressive tightening cycle where from where Fed funds is right this very moment, uh, you know, we're, we're poised to double between now and December. And that's going to have pretty material reverberations on demand uh, as we get into 2023. Elisa, there is this belief that we are going to have seen peak Fed hawkishness and that's behind us. Ian Shepardson of Pantheon wrote this. He said the Fed is boxed into a 75 basis point hike today. The latest inflation data unlikely or will likely keep the talk hawkish. Things will change by September, he went on to say. But Chairman Powell can't claim victory yet after the transitory debacle. Are you saying we've already unleashed these negative forces through Fed tightening from what we've done already alone? Are you at the same time acknowledging that we could get this Fed slowdown, Fed pause, pivot, whatever you describe it as, later this year? Uh, I'm not convinced that we're going to get a Fed pivot. I, you know, I've long been in the camp that says Fed credibility has taken a severe, severe beating uh, here. Uh, and I think it's going to be very hard, even if inflation halves from where we are today, which would put it below 5 percent, it's going to be a hard argument for uh, Chair Powell to say that that four and a half is close enough uh, in, uh, you know, economic terms to, to meet his 2 percent Fed target. So uh, this is a Fed, whether they like it or not, and whether markets like it or not, is probably going to have to, quote unquote, overdo it. Uh, to uh, regain credibility uh, with the public, which is, it seems like that's the audience that Powell is now playing to. Elisa, what is overdoing it? Can you put a number on that? What, what does that look like? Sure. So I think, you know, a lot of the wishful thinking as we talk about is this idea that uh, with this 75 basis points today, we're going to be at quote unquote neutral, the neutral rate uh, of interest in, in which we're neither stimulating nor being contractionary. Uh, and that's been estimated about 2.25 to 2.5%. To uh, our guess is that uh, the Fed funds rate is going to have to blow through that uh, by at least another 100 basis points, which puts us definitively into, quote unquote, contractionary policy. So, Lisa, we've got a tighter Fed. You think we need a profit reset. You're expecting more weak data. Let's start here and finish here. Where do you expect those profit forecast revisions to be concentrated? Is it broad based across the market or concentrated somewhere particular? Yeah, so look, I, you know, our sense is that this is going to be pretty broad based, but where, you know, a lot of our concern has focused is um, on some of the companies where expectations just have remained, uh, in our humble opinion, unrealistic. Uh, you know, again, what we're seeing with the numbers uh, in Google, Microsoft, obviously, you know, impressive given uh, maybe a particular negative sentiment, uh, but not great overall in the context of these companies. These companies have enjoyed extraordinary uh, demand growth over the last couple of years uh, and peak operating margins. And those are just things that are unlikely to be uh, sustainable in a world where the dollar is still so strong, where we're going to see recession uh, outside the United States, where we potentially are going to get close to having a recession uh, here in the U.S. 
uh, I just, uh, you know, think that it's going to be um, uh, a miracle if these guys can make the numbers that are currently forecast for them. Lisa, awesome to get your view on things. As always, Lisa Shalit there of Morgan Stanley Wealth Management. Your equity market positive today at least. That 1% on the S&P and the Nasdaq uh, by two percentage points. Coming up, rising cost pressures weighing on corporate earnings. The second quarter was our biggest challenge when it came to, uh, to inflation, but also to disruption of supply chains. We had a, a huge challenge to uh, mitigate the cost inflation. We'll take a look at some of the miners. Up next, we'll be catching up with Rio Tinto CEO Jacob Stelsholm for an exclusive conversation. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Trends that companies are talking about, too much inventory, sales are slowing, uh, margins are shrinking, labor costs up, commodity costs up, transportation costs up, worker productivity hasn't been this bad in, in something like 70 or 80 years. So the, the near-term trends are not good. Third quarter, likely to be worse. Busy week of earnings keeping markets on edge as firms warn of slowing growth and surging energy prices. Rio Tinto cutting its dividend in half as miners face a triple burden with dragging commodity prices as well. Kelly has more. Hi, Kelly. Hey, John. Yeah, Rio Tinto down in the London trade and the ADR is down about 3% in the first few minutes of the U.S. trading as well. It really goes to show you what a difference a year makes because a year ago we were talking about surging iron and copper prices due to a demand uh, picture that really couldn't be met with supply. Now we're talking about global recession and property turmoil in China, which weighs heavily on iron ore demand in particular, and that represents the lion's share of Rio Tinto's business. When you add in inflationary pressures and ballooning operating costs, what you end up with is a squeeze of profit margins. And when you put it all together, first half earnings for Rio Tinto came in at $8.6 billion. That missed the average estimate and was down substantially from the $12.2 billion, uh, the record it pulled in last year. And as a result, the dividend is getting cut in half, as you said, John, only $4.3 billion. That's only about 50% of underlying earnings. But this isn't a unique Rio Tinto problem. This is really true across the mining and material space. Growth concerns, lower prices, higher costs are affecting other companies as well. We saw that borne out with New Newmont earnings earlier this week. It plunged due to a surge in costs. Freeport McMahon coming in a little light as well. It's just a tough space to be in right now, John. It's difficult. It's tricky. Kelly, thank you. I'm pleased to say that joining us now for an exclusive conversation is the Rio Tinto CEO, Jacob Stelsam. Jacob, let's start right here. And thank you for being with us, by the way. You've halved your dividend. It's a 50% of underlying earnings. Can you help us set expectations for the rest of the year? Yeah. Is that the kind of ratio investors should expect? <laughs> yeah, well, there's two aspects. First of all, um, it is lower compared to first half of last year, but we just have to remind ourselves that was an all-time high. Iron ore price was trading above 200 dollars per ton. If you compare our results here, for example, with first half in 2020, it's much, much higher. So actually, historically, it's a very strong results we're coming out with. We have 34 percent return on capital employed, uh, the 8.6 billion underlying earnings, and we pay out 4.3 billion dollars of interim dividend. We always follow a policy of payout ratio and we normally pay out around 50 percent in the first half and that's what we have done and you know what the 4.3 billion actually represents the second highest interim dividend ever so it's what you compare against it's a high bar i appreciate that but things are getting harder as you know lower prices higher costs it's never a welcome development sir are you seeing any of those issues ease are they getting better are you bracing for it to get worse no, absolutely. Uh, look, uh, the world is in a very volatile state. Uh, when we started the year, we had not expected that there would be a war in, uh, in Ukraine. You keep on getting new uh, disruptions. And lately we have uh, learned that the, particularly the Western world has much, much more inflation than anyone would have predicted. Those represent uh, uh, challenges uh, in, the, in the short term, but long term for a miner, there is an enormous uh, need for, for our products and the energy transition that is happening now is stimulating our demand. But how do we navigate in, in, in the short term? And I would say to you, we actually sell more than half of our products into China and China does not have inflation. They have had some challenges with COVID lately. We have all had challenges as we went along. 
but they, given the fact that they don't have a high uh, inflation, they, they, they can probably easier stimulate the economy, whereas the Western economy somehow will have to find a way to, to weed out the inflation. Well, right now, as you know, they've got a nominal growth problem. They might not have an inflation problem, but they've got a growth problem for sure. We can see the lockdowns on and off. You see it in Wuhan, another one million residents locked down. You've got a fantastic line of sight into the Chinese economy, far better than me and far better than the other guests I speak to. What does demand look like right now? Is it improving? What's your sense of things at the moment? Yeah, look, uh, it, it, it has not been a strong demand in the first half, uh, but, but we are convinced, and it's always difficult to say how long time will it take, that, this, that the Chinese economy is being stimulated, and that means that more growth will come in the second half. Is it next month, or is it three months, or six months down the road? It's always difficult to say. I try to avoid predict the very short term. I'm, I'm not sure anyone is, is, is capable of doing it. But we, we, we remain convinced that the Chinese have got the, the measures and the desire to stimulate their economy. You mentioned the war with Ukraine and Russia. I recall you sold your last coal assets in Queensland back in 2018. There was always this feeling that once that door had closed, we were never going to reopen it again. And I just wonder, when you think about this ESG transition, is ESG as we know it, based on the reality check of the last 12 months, is ESG as we knew it, is it over? Is it dead? I think the opposite, because what has happened over the last year is that the price of, of gas, the price of oil have gone up. And that basically means that it's become more attractive to invest in renewable energy, because for, for Rio Tinto that use a lot of gas, a lot of, 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 of fuel, if we can replace that with renewable energy, we have a better case now in a high price scenario than we had before. No, I actually think that what the world needs in order to make the energy transition or, or, or decarbonize is an energy transition. And I, I do believe that, if anything, we will start doing more solar, more wind, uh, etc. And certainly we are doing that because we have a target of halving our carbon footprint by 2030. So you don't see coal making a comeback anytime soon? Look, I think, I think it's the wrong way to focus. The world needs energy, and if it lacks energy, then they will pull a little bit harder on coal. But the long-term trend is about getting enough renewable energy in place. And I see it happening back to China. China is investing enormously in, in renewable energy. And right now, for us, uh, we, are, we are actually taking off with some really big renewable projects in, uh, in, in Australia as well. So, Jacob, let's finish here. I've spoken to several of your predecessors. I remember Sam Walsh had to inherit the mess, the commodity bust, after the big boom we saw in China. Jean-Sebastien Jack had to shift from volume to value. How do you think you're going to define your approach in this moment? How would you characterize it? So look, uh, I, I really believe it's an amazing company with amazing assets. I'm very keen on working on the cultural development of the company, unleash the full potential of all our people, all our leaders, and future-proofing our assets. And that means also decarbonizing uh, our business. Uh, we have a big carbon footprint, but we can see a path forward. The products we are producing today are even more needed for the transition, and they are much needed after the transition as well. So I really think on the very long term with Rio Tinto. Jakob, wonderful to catch up with you, sir, and hopefully this is a part of an ongoing conversation about what you're seeing in the business, and particularly in China, which we're all trying to get visibility on at the moment. Jakob starts on there, the Rio Tinto CEO. Coming up, your trading diary, busy couple of days coming right up, including the Fed decision and some big, big mega tech earnings. All of that up next. I think it's fair to say that Snapchat is not a bad weather for ad revenue in America or for that matter worldwide based on what we saw from Alphabet ad revenue overnight. That's giving the Nasdaq a lift. The Nasdaq up by 2.3%. More a sigh of relief, according to many of you, 
than any massive beat of a low bar. Equities up by a little more than 1% on the S&P 500. Yields coming in on a 10-year this morning, going into Chairman Powell's meeting. We're down four basis points, the 276.48 on a 10-year. That's the price action. Here's your trending diary. A Fed rate decision coming up at 2 p.m. Eastern, followed by Chairman Powell's news conference. Then Facebook. I'm not going to call it meta, just can't bring myself to do it. After the close, a little bit later. US GDP and jobless claims tomorrow morning, plus more earnings from Apple and Amazon tomorrow after the close. We round out the week with PCE and the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Survey. Looking forward to that and some data out of Europe too. From New York City, I'll catch you a little bit later at 1.30 Eastern time for The Fed Decides with my colleagues Tom Keane and Lisa Bramitz on Bloomberg Surveillance. We'll take you through to the news conference and out the other side of it. From New York City, this was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.